How's everybody doing? I, um, I had dinner last night with a bunch of people from Beth Yeshua, and it was amazing just to, um, to sit and all talk about what the Lord's brought us through in the last several years. And um, we shared some funny stories and some not very funny stories, some things that weren't funny when they happened, but they're funny now, you know, those stories. And um, I praise God for that. I just want to start by... Um, Thanking the rabbi. Rabbi, we love you so much. We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for our elders that take such good care of us. Thank you, elders. We love you guys. Um, I, if you guys will just turn to your Bibles, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. I was so determined heading into these feasts, um, these feast days, to come closer to God, to, to draw near to him, and to, to tune out the world and tune tune into the things of God, and I've just really been asking myself, so after the feast, now that that's over, now what? How am I different? Was I changed? Did the feast work? <laughs> and of course, the answer to that question is yes, because of God's grace. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, you're the lucky ones. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> my name is Charles Rush. Um, I, I, I'm on staff here at um, Beth Yeshua, thanks, I forgot for a second. Um, people often ask me, what is my role here at Beth Yeshua? We're still working on that. Um, but I will tell you that I've never been so excited and so grateful and so happy to go to work in the morning in all my life. And not just because I've had some terrible jobs. Um, God has given us a very clear message about his grace this morning. And um, I, know that he's, I know that he's excited for us to hear this. It's so strange. I don't know how to communicate that to you. But he is so excited for his children to hear this this morning. He is so excited for you all to hear this, for all of us. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. Did I tell you Hebrews 4? Yep. Yes, great job. We're ahead of the curve. We're doing great. Hebrews 4, uh, verses 12 through 16. See, the word of God is alive. Wait, I got to tell you about the context of Hebrews a little bit first. I don't want to just run into it. So, you, you sh so, so, so it's written to a Hebrew audience, right? And Yeshua um, is, is being described as the completion and the perfection of Jewish belief because he's the Messiah, right? That's what it's all the book of Hebrews is about, is about Yeshua kind of perfecting and completing the Jewish faith. And so the writer says, see, the word of God is alive. Now, I could, I could start in verse 16, except it says, therefore. So you can't start there because you have to know what the therefore is there for. And you go back to f verse 15, and it says four. So then you have to know what the four is there for. So then you go back to 14, and what do you get? Therefore, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go to 13, it says before, and you definitely have to know what the before is there for. Context, context. Mm. See, the word of God is alive. Mm. Mm -mm. It is at work, and it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It just cuts right through, right through to where soul meets spirit and joints meet marrow, and it is quick to judge the inner reflections and attitudes of the heart before God. Yeah, Ooh. Before God, nothing created is hidden, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. Yes. Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, a great high priest, who's that? That's Yeshua. Yes. Who has passed through to the highest heaven, Yeshua, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge as true, for we do not have a high priest unable to empathize with our weaknesses since in every respect he was tempted just as we are the only difference being that he didn't sin hallelujah therefore let us confidently approach the throne from which god gives grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need write that one down man underline that twice So on the one hand, 
In verse 15, we know that nothing is hidden from him and all things are exposed to him, but then he ends it up by saying, therefore let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Guys, just, I don't know if this one made it in, but it's a little free before you. John chapter one, verses 16 and 17. John 1, 16 and 17. Remember the book of John was written that we might believe, right? All these things were written down that you could believe. Yes. And he says, he says, um, he's, he's, he's talking about John the Immerser there for a second. And then he says, for we have all received from his fullness. Yes, grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. You've got so much grace, your grace has grace. It's like grace with grace sprinkles now. It's like a, for the Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. And remember, Rabbi t teaches us it's 100% grace and 100% truth 100% of the time. It's not 50-50, right? And we know that only Yeshua pulls that off. So that grace, that kindness, it's... Um, it's a Hebrew, it's a Hebrew, it's a, it's a Greek word, it's, it's charis, grace, kindness, unmerited favor, unmerited favor. So we know truth, right? We're going to talk a little bit about grace this morning. In John's gospel account, um, again, it was written and recorded so faithfully as an accurate and true account of who Yeshua is so that we could read it and believe it and put our hope in Yeshua. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And later on, in, um, or earlier actually, in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We're able to know the truth because of who God is, right? And mercy we know, right? Um, again, Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our, in our, and help in our time of need. But all too often, guys, I have found, we as believers, we oversimplify grace. And I don't just mean people who call themselves Christians and are just doing whatever they want to do. I mean real, solid believers. We sometimes can be guilty of oversimplifying what grace is to our detriment. And so I believe the Lord wants to correct some things for us this morning and set some things right. If we oversimplify grace, it causes us a number of problems, primarily because we tend to overapply it, right? We use grace as a synonym for like liberality. Because there's grace, I'm okay to keep doing dot, 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 right? Because there's grace, it's okay if I still, you know, fill in the blank. And um, if you, Isaiah 61, verses one and two, it says, the spirit of Adonai is upon me because Adonai has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. Again, this is talking about Yeshua, right? Yeah. It's prophetic. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to let out into light those bound in the dark, to proclaim the year of the favor of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then it goes on to say, now listen, it says, yes, provide for those in Zion who mourn, giving them garlands instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a heavy spirit so that they will be called oaks of righteousness planted by Adonai in which he takes pride. Man, can you imagine God showing off his garden, right? These are my oaks that I planted. My grandmother had dementia and she lost her mind and they put her in a home. It was this beautiful place and my grandmother had always had this nice garden, but when she lost her mind, she thought everything at this nursing home facility for memory care people, like she thought she had planted that. And she toured Carla around. She thought Carla was her granddaughter and not me. And I mean, who would you pick if you lost your mind? You guys are in your right mind, right? Yeah, every time. And she's like, baby, grandma planted all of this. Grandma did all this, all this. Okay, if a senile old woman wants to show off her garden, can you imagine? God says, I planted these oaks. You should have seen them when I got here. It was a fat mess, but I cleaned them up, right? I transplanted them. I rerooted them. I got some water going to them. They were these nasty old spindly old things, but God breathed on them. 
Baby, none of this was here before God got here. And he, he, but listen now, there's an exchange happening. God just doesn't come and put this, this, um, he doesn't like leave them in there, right? He doesn't leave them poor. He doesn't leave them brokenhearted. He doesn't proclaim, you know, freedom to the captives while they're still locked up. Don't worry, you're free now. Great, how about the chains, right? He doesn't give garlands on top of your ashes, right? He doesn't leave you in ashes. Here's a garland, you'll feel better, right? He doesn't pour oil over your mourning. I don't mean to be flip. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be glib. I know some people are going through some crazy, crazy stuff. And I don't, I don't mean to brush over this lightly. I am telling you, the very word of God is telling you, I will provide for you. I will give you garland instead of ashes. I know that you are mourning more than your whole life will you'll ever get over it. But I'm going to give you an oil of gladness. I'm going to give you a cloak of praise instead of a heavy spirit. And you're going to be called an oak of righteousness. And so is your loved one that you're missing. Oak of righteousness. Planted by Adonai in which he takes pride. God's going to take pride in you because of what Yeshua has done. He's going to take pride in your children that are suffering. He's going to take pride in your grandchildren. So just as common and way more insidious is the error of not even understanding the powerful role of grace in the growth and effectiveness of the life and ministry of the believer, all right? Grace has a role in our, in our growth and the effectiveness of our, of our ministry. Now, nobody at Beth Yeshua would ever water down the truth, right? We would never do that. Someone would mess us up, right? We must be equally vigilant about understanding, communicating, and then operating in God's grace, there is a grace for us to operate in. We're aware, as, as, as believers, we are typically well aware of our condition within um, God's grace. We are recipients of the free gift of his unmerited favor, and we know that this grace allows us to be in a relationship with God that our status as sinful fallen creatures would not otherwise grant us. But what often escapes our attention is, is again, the role of grace in the performance of our duties as believers and assuredly, we do have duties. You know that, right? We all have stuff to do, right? We speak of grace in conjunction with something else, grace and truth, mercy and grace, and that's fine as long as we understand what grace really is. Yes, grace is unmerited favor. It is a state of grace. In his, in his letter to the believers in, in Rome, um, Shaul, Paul, he's clearing up some things amongst the believers. It's a tough, it's a tough situation in Rome because they have... They have a, a, a complex, like, congregation. They have people who are Jews, right? But they don't yet know that Yeshua is the Messiah. They have, they have Jewish people that have become messianic to understand that Yeshua is the Messiah. But then they have these, like, Gentile God-fearers that had already come into their midst bef- before Yeshua came on the scene. And then they just have just straight... Charlie Rush Gentiles, just like, just dirty, nasty Gentiles just coming in. No offense, but you know who you are. But you know, these guys, they don't know anything yet. They've heard about Yeshua. You have to imagine this crowd, right? Because you have on this end of the spectrum, you have these people that they are all about the Torah and they are all about God's word. And then you have these other people, they, they know nothing about Yeshua except, dude, he, he healed people. We're hearing about all these crazy miracles. Uh, is there any miracles left for us? Indeed, there is. Come right this way, right? So it's a, it's a very difficult congregation. And so Paul's writing to kind of clear some stuff up about who is a Jew and who is a Gentile and who's better off. And these are legitimate questions for a community of believers, kind of in a difficult set of circumstances with a lot of natural factors that can cause division. While we're on it, I love Beth Yeshua so much. Look around the room. Just look around. Yeah, there's a lot of natural factors that could cause division, Right? If we really put our minds to it, not in this house. No, not in this house. God will fix you. Yeah. Romans 3, 24. By God's grace, without earning it, all are granted the status of being considered righteous before him through the act 
redeeming us from our enslavement to sin that was accomplished by Messiah Yeshua. See, we're all in the same boat, right? God's grace, his unmerited favor cannot be argued over by his children, none of whom have earned it, but all are granted access to it by what Yeshua the Messiah did on the cross. We like two children that are both covered in muck and mud and worse, right? Arguing who, who daddy loves. Daddy loves me most. Daddy loves me most. Daddy's not loving anybody till everybody's had a shower and cleaned up. We're all recipients of his grace. Amen? All right. That's good. All right. So now in Romans chapter 5, Paul tells the Romans that, that we all Jews and Gentiles like we've come to be considered righteous before God and because of our trust and that while we were still helpless god demonstrated his love for all of us and that while we were still sinners yeshua the messiah died on behalf of us all the free gift romans 5 15 and 16 the free gift is not like the offense for if because of one man's offense many died then how much more has god's grace that is the gracious gift of one man yeshua the messiah overflowed to many no no the free gift is not like resulted from one man sinning for from one sinner came judgment that brought condemnation but the free gift came after many offenses and brought acquittal. God's grace is a free gift. It's for everyone, it's for all time, it's available to every believer. If we, if we just move forward to the end of Paul's letter to the believers in Rome, we see that in the portion of the letter that deals with the role of Gentiles and provoking some of the Jews who have not yet believed to jealousy, Paul uses the example of Elijah who, who pleads with God against Israel and... and um, Romans 11, 5 and 6, it actually, actually, it ends up quoting 1 Kings 19, 10 and 19, 14. And Elijah answers to God and he says, he says, I have been very zealous for Adonai, the God of armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They've broken down your altar and killed your prophets with the sword. Now I'm the only one left and they're coming after me to kill me too, right? We've I was going to say we've all been there, but we've not all been there, right? We've all had rough days, but Elijah went through some stuff. He, 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 no, none of us have gone through what Elijah's gone through. Not the highs and not the lows. The things he accomplished in his ministry and the things he faced, we're not there yet, right? I don't care how long you've been working in youth ministry or how long you've been on the worship team. It's not what, come on, stop it, right? And God answers and says, Still, I will spare 7,000 in Israel, every knee that hasn't bent down before Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And why is Paul, in his letter to the Romans, why is he quoting this? He says, it's the same way, in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, it's the same way in the present age. There is a remnant chosen by grace. Now, if it is by grace, it is accordingly not based on legalistic works. If it were otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. God's grace is, of course, his unmerited favor. And we know, right, we've all read the entirety of Romans. If you haven't, read it through to the end, right? Then you don't get to just go hog wild and say, okay, there's grace. Don't, don't do that. We know better than that. God's grace is his unmerited favor. But watch this now. It is so much more. It is operational grace. Operational grace. The free gift of God's grace, which does indeed grant us unmerited favor, does not merely place us in a state of grace. It also imbues us with power to provide and to work for his will. It works within us. Grace changes us for the better. Grace enhances our capacity to minister and to work and to suffer and to love and to obey. God's grace is agency and um, efficacy for building his kingdom. And no, I did not know what efficacy meant before COVID, okay? But God's grace has efficacy. Do you know what efficacy is? I thought it was effectiveness, but it's not. Efficacy describes something's ability to do what you want it to do, right? Not just efficiency that just works well, right? 100% of it works. No, efficacy describes something's ability to do what you want it to do. Am I getting that right? Dr. Kirk nodded. We're good. Thank you, God. Okay. Yeah efficacy. It makes you strong. Grace will cause you to do what he wants you to do. Grace will cause you to do what he wants you to do. I 
think probably conversely, you may not be able to do what he wants you to do if you don't slap some grace on yourself, if you don't do this grace, right? You see, God's grace is unmerited favor. It's not just this free ticket to ride the favor train to the state of grace. It's also an apron, a hard hat, a set of gloves, a sturdy pair of boots, a pair of big boy pants to equip and complete you for every good work. These people I had dinner with last night, we were, we were talking about, about moving to, to Georgia, which all of us left really great places to come here. <laughs> and we all like Georgia, and we're all happy to be here. But what if people moved here to be a part of Beth Yeshua, and then they didn't do anything? What if people moved here to be a part of what God's doing here, and then they didn't do anything? They just came and sat, and they were like, they just kind of went to Mika Mocha, and like, could someone get me a refill, please? Like, I need, I've got an itch. Could you scratch? And... <laughs> Wrong congregation, right? What if, by some weird thing, one of us were elected president of the United States in eight or nine days or whatever it is, right? And then we were, like, inaugurated, and we went to the White House to be the president in a few months, and we did our thing, and we had our time, and we, did, we went to the inaugural ball, and we went to the parade, and we slept in upstairs in the residence at the White House. I had a big breakfast in bed, and then we just wandered down to the basement for a little bit of bowling. They have a bowling alley down there. Took a dip in the pool, and wandered around the Rose Garden, and then just walked down out to Marine One, and hop a flight to Andrews, and just cruise around up in Air Force One, come back go out to Camp David and have steak dinner with your friends. What's missing? The Oval Office, baby. You got to do some work. You got to do some work. It, without grace, it's all Rose Garden. And somebody told me that nobody promised you all a Rose Garden. Yeah. Who watched that one? Yeah. Rewatch that one. Change your life. You guys, we have a job to do. We have a job to do, and I don't think anybody here is not working. I just think this, that God's grace gives us power to operate. And in talking about God's goodness to the church in Corinth and about being reconciled to God and doing their utmost to please him, Paul urges the congregation in Corinth like this. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.1. This one like jumped off the page and slapped me in the face. As God's fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive his grace and then do nothing with it. Yikes! Don't receive his grace and then do nothing with it. That's horrific. That is terrible. I received God's grace, but I'm just going to sit here and not do anything with it. That's not great. That's not great. That's not great. God's grace gives us power to serve. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it's his first letter to, to, to the church in Corinth, and Paul talks about how Yeshua appeared. <laughs> this, is, this is rough. Paul's talking about how Yeshua appeared several times after his resurrection, and then lastly, Yeshua appeared to Paul because, as Paul says, he says, I'm the least of all the emissaries because I persecuted the messianic community of God. But then he goes on to say, Paul knows who he is in the Lord. Paul knows what grace has done. He says, by, by God's grace, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, right? He's like, look, I outworked them all. Then he, right, but then he says, although it, it was not I, but the grace of God with me. It was the grace of God with me, right? If it was just, if Paul just was like, I've got better hygiene than those guys, he wouldn't brag about that. That's not who, you know, nobody's saying no, but it was the grace of God. I've outworked them all by the grace of God, by the grace of God. God's grace also gives us power to give. Second Corinthians 9, 8. Moreover, God has the power to provide you. Listen to this. God has the power to provide you with every gracious gift in abundance so that always and in every way you will have all you need yourselves and be able to provide abundantly for every good cause. This is God's grace. And 
Romans 5, 18. I don't know if this made the cut for the slides. I apologize. Romans 5, 18 through 21. In other words, just as it was through the offense that all people came under condemnation, so it is also through one righteous act that all people come to be considered righteous. We did that part, didn't we? Look at God's grace gives us power to suffer. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he told me, my grace is enough for you, for my, my power is brought to perfection in weakness. Therefore, I am very happy to boast about my weakness in order that the Messiah's power will rest upon me. I don't want to go past that part too, too quickly, guys. Don't, don't get it twisted. The, the weakness still exists here. The weakness wasn't removed and then power put upon it. No, that weakness is still there. And Paul, I don't know if he just was being private or he just forgot to, but it was a stroke of genius not to mention what the thorn in the flesh was, right? Because everybody thinks they know what it was, right? If you talk to an alcoholic, they know what the, right? If you talk to somebody with gout, they know what Paul's, that's not funny, gout sucks, it's just the worst, right? Everybody knows, as somebody in an unhappy marriage, like, oh, I know, Paul wasn't even married, stop. Everybody thinks they know what that, but here's the thing. Whatever it was, that weakness wasn't removed from Paul. That weakness became the perfect setting for this powerful gem, this powerful jewel that is God's grace. My grace is sufficient for you. We see in these these verses that an operational grace that works and not just a state that believers might exist in, but rather a power with which they might operate. I want you guys to look at 1 Peter 4.10. 1 As each one has received some spiritual gift, he should use it to serve others like good managers of God's many-sided grace. Yes. As someone speaks, let him speak God's words. All right. As someone serves, let him do so out of strength that God supplies, yes. so that in everything, everything, God may be glorified through Yeshua the Messiah. Yes. Guys, look at the context of 1 Peter 4, 10. That is brutal stuff. Look at... Just go to verse 1. Therefore, since the Messiah suffered physically, you too are to arm yourselves with the same attitude. For whoever has suffered physically is finished with sin, with the result that he lives the rest of his life, this earthly life no longer controlled by human desires, but by God's will. For you have, you have spent enough time already living the way the pagans want you to live, in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, wild parties, and forbidden idol worship, they think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of dissoluteness, and so they, keep, they, they heap insults on you, but they, will have, but they will have to give an account to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Yes. This is why he was proclaimed to those who have died. It was so that although physically they would have received the, punish, the judgment common to all humanity, they might live by the spirit in the way that God has provided. Then look at verse seven. The accomplishing of the goal of all things is is close at hand. A lot of other translations simply say the end of all things is near. The accomplishing of the goal of all things is close at hand. Therefore, keep alert and self-controlled so that you can pray more than anything Keep loving each other actively. More than anything. More than anything. More than anything. Keep loving each other actively. More than anything? Yeah. More than anything. More than anything. Because love covers many sins. Welcome one another into your homes without grumbling. And then he says, as each one has received some spiritual gift, he should use it to serve others like good managers of God's many-sided grace. 
If someone speaks, let him speak God's words. If someone serves, let him do, it, do so out of strength that God supplies. Guys, this many-sided grace, this uh, multifaceted, no, I did not have to look up multifaceted, right? I did have to look up manifold. I thought it was a part of a car. Some say manifold. <laughs> the, um, do you have that slide with the Greek on it, that poikilos? Poikilos. It's translated by Stern as multifaceted. Most translations say manifold. But the Greek word, it actually means multicolored. Clearly, you know, Peter doesn't do it all the time, but when he decides to turn a phrase, the Holy Spirit speaks through Peter. He just gets it so right. What is grace? It's a multifaceted gem, a many sided, many colored gem of grace that has been perfectly set in the setting of your weakness, of my weakness. Nobody learned to read slower than I learned to read. I cannot math at all. I remember talking to my mother about my mathematical skills, and she, seriously, she said, I taught you to read. You are on your own. Get a calculator. Get out. Go. You do not know how stressful it was to read. I was a horrible child. I was, it was not good. I was super hyperactive. I've calmed way down. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, my mother's name is Crystal, and you can pray for her. She's still just down there in Texas, just getting over it. <sighs> you guys, my mother did such a good job, but it was not. And she says I was the easy one. You, you ask her. She says I was the easy one of three boys. Mercy. Somebody just started crying over there. Um, you guys, God's, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Yeah. This multifaceted grace, multicolored grace. This grace, if you, if you walk around it, the light shines through it, and it's different all the time, yeah. all the time. You come in here, and the, the light coming through these stained glass windows one time I was in here at night just by myself and there was moonlight coming through. I thought I was just going to die and go to heaven. I was so happy. It's so beautiful. Guys, God's multi-sided, multi-faceted grace is operational in your life. It's working. It's active. It's working in your life. And, and so you was, I, I'm weak. My body's weak. I got to take all this medicine. I, I, all this stuff's going on. I, I, I'm not saying I get it, but I know God gets it. And yet his multifaceted grace continues to operate perfectly within the setting of your weakness. My mind, my heart, my emotions. You don't know what happened to me. I don't. But I know that God's multifaceted grace is upon you. I'm not a prophet, and I'm not saying that to sound humble. I'm saying that because I don't want to be sawed in half. But I, I asked God. I was walking right out here on the sidewalk, and I just said, God, is this the message? These people know about grace. These people know why... I asked God, if this is the message, then why? And I felt very clearly that the Lord spoke to me and said, in order to go through what's coming, you're going to need more grace. I know you guys know this. I know you know what to do. I know you're doing it. I'm simply here today to encourage you with the goodness of God. I am here today to encourage you with the goodness of God. If you just don't hear anything else I say up here and you go to lunch and somebody asks you, if little kids that are listening, if your parents ask you, what was the sermon about? Charlie said, uh, God is good. They nailed it. Leave them alone. Feed them. <laughs> God is so good. Just focus on the goodness of God. Be in his grace. Love one another. Just keep loving one another and just keep focusing on God's grace. I do not pretend to know what you're going through with, with your spouse, with your children, 
even your adult children, I do not pretend to know, but I know God's grace and I know God loves you. The world is so bad right now and so hard and at, at times it's just terrible to live in this world. And if that doesn't make sense to you, give it a few minutes. But I maintain that God is so good, so, so good. I know that because he gives me grace. God's grace is not only a state for me to exist in, but a manifold, multifaceted power to move in. A power that helps me not to lose my mind, not, not for us to not lose our sanity to the craziness of this world, not to lose our salvation, not to stop loving one another. God's multi-sided grace is the power by which we operate in service, teaching, benevolence, obedience, love, and suffering, and so much more. It's not merely about existing or even growing. We will not survive without grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. This grace provided by Adonai Echad, our one God, has many sides, many colors, like the facets of one mighty, beautiful gem, a single majestic stone that we are called to be good managers of. We are called to not merely exist in a state of grace, but to operate in power, strength, and abundance so that in everything God may be glorified through Yeshua the Messiah. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Good job, Charlie. You know what? Charlie's a real blessing to this place. A lot of you don't know what all he does. Uh, when, we, when we built this place, it needed to be taken care of. The building, the grounds, everything. And I used to do a lot of that myself, along with a few others. And then like Charlie said, you know, people came here, moved in from other places, and we put them to work. And Charlie has been a really blessing to this place and to me because he's like my right-hand guy whenever I need something done. He just knows how to do it now. He's, I mean, he's picked it up and he runs with it. So, Charlie, I really appreciate you and I love you, man. And uh, thank you for that uh, word today. Yes. It really touched on us. And now... <laughs> What's so funny? Am I missing something? Yes. Charlie. Oh, I... You need to stay where I can see you. <laughs> he got me good the other night. We was here practicing. I said I wasn't going to say anything while he was doing his message. But we were all here practicing, and it was dark outside, and the moon was coming through the window, just like he said. And all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a song, and the lights go out. Am I right, Darren? The lights go out, okay? And it's Charlie back there messing with us. And I told him, I says... <laughs> I says, you wait till you start preaching on Shabbat. I said, I'm going to get you back. But I told him I would never do that. I would never do that because I love him too much for that. So, Lord, just thank you for this day. Thank you for that message. And uh, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You're at an eye, Panavaleka. Be Kunika, you sat on a high, Panavaleka. Be assemblica. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shalom.